my name is Daryl Michael Wilkerson Sr. I was born and raised in South Central Los Angeles on the east side. Oh boy, I've been through hell and high water to find this spot. Um, this is where um, I usually uh, come after a long day of uh, hustling and uh, recycling or, and doing whatever I have to do to survive. And I usually come here and um, I mean, I know I've, I've met a lot of people who've been in this spot, but I've never seen anybody sleep in this spot. So uh, about two weeks ago, I had a spot with a tent over here off of uh, Burbank and Radford by the freeway. And I was there for two weeks. Um, I had a tent, neighbors didn't complain, everything was fine. Then uh, one day, a man from Caltrans came through, and then about three days after that, uh, a man and a woman from Caltrans, Caltrans came through and gave me some uh, paperwork and told me that I had to leave the premises that I was uh, trespassing on state property. So I decided to come here and sleep here. And this is my world, this is where I sleep at every night. This is my second time sleeping here, unfortunately. And roaches crawl and, and crickets and, and you know, but uh, I hate to say this, but you know, it's something that I'm used to. I mean, I'm almost almost been homeless. Oh, I've been homeless off and on since I was, mm, man, I have to go back to 1995. I'd stay, I lived on Skid Row for 12 years, off and on, prison, jail drugs, all kind of, you know, crazy things, you know, and I just, you know, I, w I was born and raised in South Central LA, but I went to school, I was bussed out here in 76. Uh, my mom wanted me to get away from the neighborhood, and uh, so I was bussed here and went to uh, junior high school, high school, and like two semesters of uh, junior college out here in the valley, so I do know the valley. So I had a choice between out here in the valley or go back to downtown LA and go back to Skid Row. And I didn't want to go back to Skid Row. So I, you know, I feel safe from here. You know, um, I'm able to do more things, even though downtown LA have more resources. They have places where they, you know, free food, uh, showers, clothing, you know, but the, the cold part about it is trying to get housing and it's the same down there as it is out here and it's tougher out, out here because they don't have that many shelters out here they don't have any uh, uh, um, you know uh, rescue missions and all that out here they have that back downtown but I feel that if I go back downtown then I'll just start just doing drugs all over again and, and, and my life will really be spinning out of control and and I'll be back back in jail, you know, uh, I'll be back in the pen. I mean, I haven't been on probation or parole since um, 2012. I got off probation and parole. Um, last time I was in LA County Jail was 2014, and I haven't been back since. And I don't plan on going back. So I just feel safer out here. I mean, people out here, are, you know, it's the way you, it's not what you do, it's how you do it and the way you talk to people. And Nick, I've got people out here willing to help me. I even had the police out here trying to get me some housing and whatnot, but, uh, uh, you know, things have been real slow. The, they just got, you know, allegated with all this money to, to help the housing, the homeless and get to some housing, but hey, I don't see them building anything. I don't see them rushing, okay, we're gonna give this, this group this money, we're gonna give this group this money, and we're gonna build this and build that and, and take the housing off the street. Because there's all the money that's, that's in the United States of America, ain't no such thing as how it should be homelessness at all. It's, you know, you got other countries like France and Canada, free medical, health care. Here, we got to pay for it. I'm only on GR, and that's about the end of December, uh, at the end of this year. So, um, my plan is to, to get back on my feet. I'm gonna to go to the uh, VA next month, which I should have done 
long time ago, but I didn't because I'm not a vet. And they told me I wasn't eligible for anything because you're not a vet, you didn't do six months, so you ain't got nothing coming. But since you was in the service for almost four months, we have, the Army have their own little housing thing or Section 8 thing. And I'm going to go down there and, you know, I got to take a TB test, pay $25 for that, you know, and all this rigging, you know, and, 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 and you know, we're going to take it from there. Because I, I, I'm getting tired, you know. I'm tired of being out here in the elements. I was out here when it was raining. I mean, when I first came out here last year, I was sleeping in the alley, you know. <laughs> you know, and the police was, was harassing me each and every day. People were calling, and why is this guy over here up in front of my business sleeping? Why is this guy, you know, you know I just, you know, it's just, it, it's, you know, it's, it's just nerve wracking. I mean, because it's me, myself, and God, or God, myself, and I. That's it. I have three full grown kids, but I don't ask them for nothing because it, I wasn't there for them when they were growing up. You know, and we we have a strange relationship, but I love them. You know, and uh, I, I grew up without a father. You know, I'm the only child, but I have nine brothers and sisters in Arkansas. I've only met three of them, so, and I haven't gotten in contact with them either. I'm also a grandfather of two, two children. My youngest daughter has twins, so I was over there in June because the, the twins' birthdays was in, in, in the May, and I got there kind of like a week or two late. But I brought them little presents and whatnot. So that made me feel good, you know. That made me feel, you know, because I, I, you know, I, I knew how it was when I was growing up, you know. Being an only child sucks. It stinks. But, you know, I, I got through it. I got through it. Yeah, well, see, the thing is, my father left me when I, he left, Oh, I don't know the situation between him and my mom's. You know, my mom's never really explained that too much because I grew up around women. My grandmother raised me when my mom went to work or school. And then when my grandmother passed in, in 1977 at the age of 14, my mother took over. And that wasn't easy, you know. And um, my, my father left me when I was seven. 1970, he went back home to Arkansas, because that's where he's from, Lake Village, Arkansas. And I, I've never seen my father since. Um, back in 97, uh, my father wanted to come out here and, and, and find me, and he came out here. But guess what? I was up in a rehab program, you know, so I missed out on that. And so in the year 2006, my father passed away and my mother passed away. I was tired of taking care of my mother, you know, home co the home care thing and whatnot, because my mother was getting you know, up in age and she was getting sick, but I was doing drugs heavily in the neighborhood and back and forth and downtown. And, uh, you know, when my mother died, you know, um, I wasn't even there for her. I, I was downtown living with, shacking up with some girl and, uh, I think I went to my um, I went to my uh, auntie's house about two, three weeks after they buried my mother. And my, and, uh, but first I was in a rehab program and then I wrote a letter to my auntie and my auntie came to the Union Rescue Mission downtown where I was at and when I saw her and I saw the look on her face, I knew there was something wrong. And uh, she told me my mother was asking for me and this and that and you know I, I couldn't handle it I, I broke down because you know it's, <clears throat> I should have been there for her so I'm my only child and um, I wasn't and that still hurts today to this day and um, you know <clears throat> the reason why I'm in this situation is because of the bad choices that I made in my life. And that's one of the bad choices I made, you know. And right now, all I want to do is just have a, a second chance in life. I'm 54 years old, I'm not getting no younger. You know, um, I just want a chance to, you know, get to get back on my feet, get a job, start writing movie scripts again, which I learned how to do that when I was in prison and jail. Somebody had taught me how to do that. 
And bad, the, the worst part about that, I haven't wrote in four years because of my struggles out here. And um, I put all my stuff, my everything that I wrote down was destroyed. My, my girl threw all my stuff away because I was living with this girl for five years and we broke up about a year and a half ago and she got a section eight and went her way. And me, I just didn't give a damn no more and give a fuck, so I just, you know, and I end up down here. But I had put all my scripts, I wrote seven movie scripts. I put them on Google Drive. And to this day, Google Drive has no, nothing on them. They have no, you know, email, all that that I had that I was using for that year. All that's gone. So once I get back on my feet, you know, I got my head straight, I'm gonna have to sit down and write all of them over again, plus some new stuff, you know. But all I'm doing, all I'm looking for is a second chance. And um, I wanna do all this, what I'm saying right now, before Christmas. Because last Christmas, and this is the reason why me and my, uh, my uh, three kids are not really, well, two now. Because me and my youngest daughter, we kind of got an understanding now, you know. I just want to give a shout out to uh, Daryl Jr., Taisha, and Ashley. But um, last Christmas, since me and my kids, they never spent no holidays together, um, I asked them, you know, to spend some time. And they like, what for? You wasn't around when we needed you. So why should we? And I blew up. I went off. And I'm usually a mild-mannered kind of guy, but I just went off. And I haven't spoken to my youngest, my oldest son, my son, my only son, and my oldest daughter in like eight, nine months. Uh, you know. You know, and I hate that it's like that, and it shouldn't be like that. But all I asked for was something very simple. Let's just at least spend one holiday together, and they didn't even want to do that. Oh, well, I'm going out here to my mom's in Lancaster. I'm doing something else, and I'm doing something else. So Thanksgiving and Christmas. Thanksgiving, I was living in, living in the alley, sleeping in the alley, and uh, I think the owner of the uh, place came out and gave me a $50 bill, and I just laid back down, you know? And on Christmas, I don't know what the heck I was, I know Christmas, I was, I was so pissed off. I, I was getting high downtown. I was getting high. I didn't give a damn, you know. I was that hurt. So, this Christmas, almost 12 months later, we're gonna try to do this again. But for me, in order for me to do this, I got to get myself together. I got to be strong. And I am, I, I, I've been stronger, I've been through a lot. I've been through a lot from sexual abuse all the way to the drugs, the beat downs, and all kind of crap, gang, all that. I've been, been there, done that. I'm done. So like I said, you know, I'm just <coughs> asking God to give me a, a second chance. And I just want to be able to make better decisions and, and be with my little family, you know. You never, you never know what you miss. You know, when your moms and your pops leave, take them for granted. But once they leave, they gone. You know, never think about that until it's over. Yeah, you know, and I don't know how much time I got left. So my advice to you, your mom's still alive, make up. Like, I can't. I can't, um, I can't go to my mom or my father. And I don't want that to happen with me and my kids. Yeah. But, um, other than that, it's all good. God is good. It's all good.
knowing me, I would probably say money, but to be honest, resources. You know, housing, clothing, uh, a job. You know, because I was talking to King earlier today, and he was telling me this, this vision about what we got going in this uh, documentary. And I was like, you know what? You kind of like me when I was doing my movies because he was that memory. He was asking me all these questions. How'd you? I said, I don't know. This guy told me to just use vision and imagination. And that's what I was doing. And, you know, sometimes it's kind of hard to put on paper, but I did it. Oh, and that's another thing. The reason why sometimes I'm in, I think that I'm in the position that I'm in, that I'm in, because I, there's a lot of things I've started in life, but I've never finished. But doing the movie scripts, I started and I finished them. And that's kind of like the only thing in my, in my whole life that I finished, started and completed. Well done. And all I was trying to do was um, sell them on the internet and that didn't go too good it's because it's not what you know, it's who you know. So. But I just can't wait to uh, get started um, to writing again. Oh, and let me give a shout out to four of the best friends I ever had in my life. And I haven't seen them in like about four or five years. We used to call ourselves the Awesomes. And uh, we kind of started this kind of group out, group when we was like in seventh grade. And um, I haven't seen them in a while. You know, we used to have a good time. We learned a lot from each other. We used to clown and, oh man, we used to have a good time. Me, Roderick, Eric, um, Benny, Anthony, and I'll throw my cousin Howard in there, you know. And we always talked about, because half of them guys was in the band that I had when I was, in, I was 17. I had a band from uh, 17 to, from 1980 to 1985, no, 86. And we broke up because we got lazy and didn't want to do something. Well, actually it was a woman that got in between us and that kind of started that, that, that fallout. But, uh, you know, um, then a year later, 1987, I started doing drugs, crack. You know, and I've been doing it off and on ever since. You know, sometimes I can just stay off of it. Sometimes I just get pissed, get triggered, and then there I go. You know, but um, right now I'm just ma maintaining because I'm done with rehabs. I've been to too many of them. So every time you see me, you ain't never seen me high or, you know, so. Oh yeah, we call them ourselves the Awesomes. So I want to give a shout out to the Awesomes. I just want to give a shout out to them. And your band, what mm -hmm. did you, did, were you the singer? Did you play? Well, I was actually, when, when we started back in, um, what was that, 80? I was, um, I, was the, I was the leader that put the band together, but I, I played bass. Actually, I, when we first started, I was the lead singer, but my voice kind of got heavy. So one of the guys in the Awesomes, who was from my neighborhood, who was my best friend, I mentioned his name, Eric, uh, I had him become the lead singer, and then my, my cousin Howard played the drums, and then his brother Darren, those are my second cousins. And I, their mother's my first cousin, but I call her my auntie because she's like almost 20 years older than me. and. Um, um, you wanted to know what kind of music we play? Well, actually, when we first started, we were called the Action Band, and we, we was, actually, we were two groups in one, because back in them days, I was the R&B side of the, of the band, and Tony and Howard was the K-Rock side of the band. So we did R&B, rock and roll, K-Rock type stuff. 
And this was all going on when Duran Duran and all the new wave uh, bands from uh, England was coming out. And my, when Michael and Prince was doing their thing, Ready for the World and Jesse Johnson, and, you know. And I felt the music that we had could have rivaled right up there with them, but we never, we never took it seriously. I never took it seriously because out of everybody in the band, only one person in the band knew how to read music. We did everything by ear. We recorded by ear because the music that we wrote was simple and it was fun and it was hip. And um, one day I met the manager of, uh, oh, what's the name of that group? group that sings Mama Sita. Damn, what's the name of that, that group? But anyway, I was doing security work on Wilshire Boulevard, up in uh, some old rich white guy. He, he owned this whole building. And I ran into these, to this uh, producer or agent or whatever, and I told him I had a band. And I, we sat down in his office one day, and he says, uh, you got a band, huh? He says, what kind of music do you play? And I told him what kind of music we play, and then he says, uh, well, who do you sound like? And I just looked at him and said, who do we sound like? We sound like us. We changed that name at, at that time to the Attic Boys. We're, you know, well, you, in order to make it music, you gotta sound like somebody. I said, that's not the way we do it though. We sound like us. Nobody has our sound but us. So, but those were the good old days back in the 80s. And those, and those songs, they're missing too. Just like my comic book collection that my mom threw away, <laughs> that's gone. My music collection, that's gone. I had the last, my cousin Howard had the last tape of, of, of any recorded music that we had. And because we, reason why we called ourselves an Attic Boys was we're, we're staying at, my auntie and them are staying in my grandmother's original house that they bought on the east side. And it was an attic upstairs. So we would always go upstairs and play upstairs. That's so we changed our name to the attic voice. So out of all my band members, out of all the awesomes, I'm the only one that's homeless. I'm the only one that did the drugs. I'm the only one basically that went to jail and prison. Neither of them have, have not that I know of. They all got jobs, they all got families now, they got their own kids. So, it could happen. I wouldn't mind going in there, you know, jamming with the with the with the uh, with the band for the you know for the first time in almost what well here what is it nine not twenty what well, we'd be like thirty years or over thirty years, you know, and be able to sing uh, "Runaway Love" and and you know. Uh, so many songs that we written, we written over 80 songs, but I think we only recorded like about 15. But they was they were some good, they were some good 15 hit songs. We at least we thought so. You know, the ways of going about it, because I mean, I'm looking at King and he's telling this guy to put his his jacket sleeve for the for his three singles that he's gonna drop, and he's telling the guy to move this to my eye and you know and all this, and I'm like. Dang, you know what? I, I should have stuck with something like this. Got into learning how the computer and shit. My girl told me, you're not computer savvy and boop. Yeah, well, she didn't teach me nothing, so I learned basically on my own. You know, like I learned how to drive a stick on my own, you know. Yeah, I just need a little help, you know. And uh, your boy, he said he's He's given me this opportunity to try to help, you know, help me. And I had another guy give me some some, some stuff telling me about, you know, trying to help. I mean, I, like I said, I, there, there are some people that care. There are some people that see me trying to do things instead of just sitting up at 7-Eleven or just hanging around, not trying to make no money, not trying to do nothing with yourself. You know, I'm trying to do something with myself. So, like I said, next month, Next month I'm gonna be pretty busy, so you know I might not even be. You might not even see this anymore, most likely. As long as you know, we still know where to find you. Oh yeah, oh yeah, because King's telling me he's gonna move, so 
or like they looking for places to move. So we gonna have, I already got an address. I haven't written it down, but I already got an address where, you know, I see whatever he gonna do for me or whatever. He can send it to my daughter's house in Harthorn and, you know, but I don't think I'm gonna be that far because once I go to the VA, if I live on the VA site down there in Wilshire, you know, all I need is just a phone. These Obama phones, through. I met King, I just, I used to just do my little recycling route and I guess I would see him and you know, really, you know, just passing through or whatever. But one day he was in a truck and I was like, hey man, you got any change for a homeless black man? And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, so I run up to the truck, I push the buggy to the side and we kind of got to talking there and I kind of told him my situation and whatnot. And I just kept seeing him there and here and there and there and here, you know, until last week when we sat there and talked about doing this documentary. And I'm like, okay, I'm with that. I'm with that. So here we are. Well, I was grateful. And, but I never did go. I never did go, because I was always doing everything on my own. Until one day, one night, I was laying here and I was tired, I probably did some drugs or whatever, and I, I got up and it's about 10 o'clock at night and I went to his apartment, knocked on his door. I don't know if I said the right name or what, but three people, a black woman, a child, Another child opened the door and I said, mentioned the name. And they said, and no one here lives here by that name. See you later, bye. And I was so embarrassed, I just turned around and walked away. And so when I said to myself, I said, King must be bullshitting me, man. This, you know, he don't live there. Woo, woo. So I said, the next time I see King, I'm going to tell him about it. So one day I was going to start my route. Next thing I know, hey, Mike. Oh, he was coming down. I, I told him what happened. Oh, man, that was my sister and this and that, man. Yeah, man, I live up there, man. And so I said, well, what is your name? I said, I said Kent Craig or something like that. I, he said, King. I said, okay. And then, you know, it slipped me a couple of dollars, and we just took it from there. It was cool. And then this thing last week, when I met you guys, I'm like, Things are going in my head like, what is he talking about? What do you mean putting me on here? Because I always wanted, I see other people go on YouTube and I was like, damn, I wonder how they do that. You know what I'm saying? I had no, re no um, inclination of how, you know, people make videos and people get beat up and all. You know, they just film anything and just throw it on YouTube. So I said, well, here, here's an opportunity. I mean, I ain't trying to be no star or nothing like that, you know, but People, his people, his fans recognize him and uh, to be a part of that. Okay, I'm cool. Yeah, you know, they probably, I said, I'll ask him today. I said, well, them people might see me in your video and they're like, who's this guy? And he just said, man, just say what you, what you feel, man. Just let it all out, whatever. So here we are well, once I, again. Did you let it all out? Yeah, because I wasn't expecting Expecting to feel that way about, you know, my mother and my father and my family as a whole, but it's a lot of pain there. It's a lot of pain there. So it was good to get it out. And if my kids see this, I still love y'all. And we gonna get it together. And it's and you know we gonna be a family before it's all said and done. Simple as that. With the blessing of God, it's so pleasant.